good morning. It is so good to see each of you this morning. And for those of you who are still joining us online, welcome. Thanks for tuning in today. We're praying for you and hoping to see you again soon. Here we are the last week of April, right in the middle of spring. And we had a brief day of winter. Ugh. I like winter in the winter, but come spring, if it were might up to me, it would be 70 and sunny and only rain at night. What about you? But here it is, on Wednesday morning, I pull out of my driveway on my way to work. And there was this unexpected beauty. The way God had allowed the snow to fall on the trees that were covered in leaves, we don't often get to see that. And I was very quickly reminded that he is God and I am not. How many times does he say to us, I hear what you're asking for, but I have something unexpectedly beautiful planned. This morning, I want to praise God because just as I said, He is God and I am not. He is an awesome, sovereign God. We love Him. We desire to praise Him and worship Him. From Ephesians 3, now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more all that we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Stand with us. Let us worship the one true sovereign God. We pray that his presence would be made known in this place. We don't have to ask him to come because we know that he's here. Amen. All right, let's have fun with him today.
make our requests known to God and we can continue to praise Him in the middle of the storm. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. 
God, we cry out to you and we give you all of our prayers and our petitions. And with thanksgiving, we make our requests known to you, knowing that you hear our prayers and you are faithful. There is a faith proved of more worth than gold, so refine me, Lord, through the flames. Father God, we thank you for the refinement. Thank you for shaping our hearts and strengthening our faith. Your word says, I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. Father God, I pray for our hearts to hear the word that you put on Pastor Steve this morning, that you would continue to refine our lives so that we will show the world that truly the Lord is our God. Amen.
what you say Though the storms may come and the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast And let my heart learn when you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faithfulness to What is prayer? Stale tradition? Ritual? A good luck charm? Part of some religious checklist? Done to appease a higher being so we can get what we want? 
or at least avoid the lightning bolt. Prayer has been redefined and twisted and confused, but at its essence, prayer is simply talking to God, the God who spoke the universe into creation, who gives us life and breath, who holds all things together. This God wants us to talk to him in the vastness of all that exists. He actually cares about us personally, individually. How can we not pray to such a loving God? Wherever we are, how can we not thank him for what he's done or cry out when we need help, when we need forgiveness, when we're afraid, when we give thanks for our blessing or question where our next meal will come from? Why would we live a life apart from him? It's not about formula. How could any posture or well-chosen word impress the author of time and space? It's simple obedience. God has made himself available to us. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to trust in him, to acknowledge our dependence on him, to draw near to the one who loved us first. Approaching with confidence because Christ has torn away the veil. He's washed away the sin that kept us from his presence. And we live in relationship with our Lord. And so we ask that his kingdom come, his will be done on earth and in our lives as it is in heaven. That is prayer. Sometimes in church, we can use big words that we don't use anywhere else, like words like sanctification, predestination, justification, or if you work here, I need a vacation. You know, th th those kind of things are huge. And, and one of those words that's a part of what prayer is, is the word supplication. Now, supplication basically means to ask for stuff, so I don't know why we don't just say ask for stuff instead of supplication, but that's the word that prayer is that we want to talk about this morning. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, thanks for being with us online. We're grateful for everyone who's part of the Southland Experience every Sunday morning, and we want you to grow in your understanding of who God is and even more how to connect with him, and that's what this series is all about. See, prayer is something that it doesn't just come naturally. It's something that you can learn. You can discover God's purpose in it and how he wants you to connect with him through it. And honestly, it's the greatest thing the Christian has. I mean, it's how we first introduce ourselves to God and simply say to him, hey, I know the truth about myself and I need your grace in my life. That all starts with us praying to him, but it goes much deeper as we continue our experience and walk with him. And so that's why Jesus, when he was with his disciples, uh, he found them one day, they found him one day praying. And so they came up to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he did. He taught them what we know as the Lord's Prayer. He also included this Lord's Prayer in his teaching on a famous sermon he preached we call the Sermon on the Mount that you can find in Matthew 5 through 7. Today, that piece of it is Matthew chapter 6. So if you have a Bible or a device with the Bible on it, I want to encourage you actually to go along with us today in Matthew chapter 6 because we're going we're gonna to pull out portions of it, but it's all put into context as to what he's trying to teach us about trusting God with the things that we need. Now, as we have been doing through the series, we'll continue to do it. I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me. Now, it's not meant to just be recited as some kind of a ritual that we do in church. Rather, it's meant to give you sort of an outline of what your prayer experience with God can be all about. So here we go, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to begin with verse 9. Pray it out loud with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
Now, in, in Matthew, uh, he did not include what, what we found later in, in, in later manuscripts, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And perhaps if you learned that prayer yourself, you attach that to it, that's fine. Keep praying that. Keep adding that to it. That's a great way to close that prayer. But last week, we focused on, with this prayer, who it is that we pray to. That he is hallowed or hallowed or holy is his name. And that he is crazy, has crazy love for us, and yet he's to be worshipped and trusted and approached with the submissive spirit. And there's, we emphasized over and over again, hey, look, this isn't just your jogging buddy. This is a holy God that you approach and pray to. And then in the prayer, we just read it, he reminds us to bring our daily needs to him. Here it is again, just this little part, give us today our daily bread. That's really what we're going to focus on today. I'm going to spend a whole sermon on that. I know you find that hard to believe, but maybe you don't. Jesus helps us to understand the content of our requests. What need do you ask for? I mean, when you come to God in prayer, what is typically the content of your prayer to him? Well, later on, he tries to help us with this. And so a little bit later in the passage, beginning with verse 19, here's what he said. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, nor do thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, supplication is asking God to supply a need. Those are the English words we use to translate. It it seems simple enough, but that's why Jesus went into a little more detail in his teaching about what we treasure in our life and ultimately the stuff that we pray for. You see, here's the first thing I think he's telling us. When you're asking for stuff, supplication, examine your motives. I mean, why is it that I'm praying for this thing? I mean, here's the basic question that we all need to ask ourselves. What is the thing that I want most in life? I mean, think about that, because the way you answer that question is pretty foundational to the vast majority of the choices that you will make, and what's also foundational to the way you approach and pray to God. You see, it's interesting because the answer to that question ultimately is what fills your time, it controls your money, and it consumes your thoughts. Now, the problem is that a lot of people haven't taken the time to ask themselves that question and have no idea what they're chasing after every day. I mean, I know I want some kind of fulfillment in my life, And so I chase after more wealth or more stuff or certain relationships or some kind of a title or a career or status. But what is the thing that I really want most in life? What am I chasing after? See, maybe this is your prayer. This might be what Lord, my prayer for this coming year is a fat bank account and a thin body, but please don't mix them up like you did last year. <laughs> well, we don't, that, that could be your prayer, but what is it that you really long for? In other words, Jesus used this word, treasure. What is it that you treasure the most and you really want for your life? What do you most value? Jesus says you won't find fulfillment in the temporary stuff of this world, if that's what you're praying for. Now, most of Jesus' listeners lived just day by day. You know, we we call it paycheck to paycheck, only theirs was even more limited. It's like today, if I can just make sure I've got food, I've got clothes, I've got a place to sleep tonight that's safe, I'm good until tomorrow. And that's pretty much how they focused on life, the basics. Now, in the prayer, give us today our daily bread. They literally meant it. And he shows them that God cares, in fact, for all of those basic human needs in your life. 
what you need matters to God. And I think you ought to focus on that because notice the focus of his prayer. Give us today our daily bread. He doesn't pray, God, bless me today with great wealth, much stuff, and a boatload of pleasure. That's not his model of prayer. The essence of prayer is, Lord, give me what I need to live my life in your kingdom for your glory. And we'll talk more about those in coming weeks. But what I need matters to God. But am I hoping for wanting something and chasing after things I don't need? Is my pursuit treasures on earth and really nothing more? Well, what what is it I'm really praying for that fits into this whole model of the kingdom of God and me fulfilling the will of God or purpose of God in my life? You know, it's funny, when I open uh, my my news feeds or I'm seeing advertising, most of the time, the advertisers are not all that interested in whether or not I'm doing the will of God. They just want to make sure that I believe that I'll be happy or fulfilled, or successful, or safe if I buy their product, especially that safe one, you know, because in order for me to purchase their product to be safe, I first have to be scared that I'm not safe. And so they bring all of these images in to try to help me believe that what I'm chasing after in life is found in their product, consuming resources instead of investing resources. And and that's why it's really interesting what Jesus said in verse 19. Where moths and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. You see, we're taught to want more stuff that we just can't keep. And it's interesting, we will ultimately be leaving all of this behind someday, and yet for some reason we passionately run hard after it all. I mean, maybe you've been there. Jesus saying it here, store up treasures in heaven where it will last, and ultimately he's saying where it will matter forever. Now, so far, I've not purchased a product that gives me a forever warranty, not one. But Jesus says that's the whole point. The only thing that you will keep forever is the thing you give away. And he wants you to discover the fulfillment that happens when that is what's guiding your prayers, when that's the foundation of your prayers. See, here's what happens to your thinking. When you chase hard after earthly ideas of happiness, you'll end up with probably one or more of the following. First, you have more expense then to maintain and ensure and protect whatever it is that you buy. It keeps costing you money. Or it doesn't fulfill you ultimately, and, it, and, you, and you end up changing it out for more stuff. It's because the stuff is never ultimately giving you what you're looking for. Or disappointment in it. I mean, it's just not what you thought it was, and you have buyer's remorse. But here's something that happens to a lot of people as they chase hard after the treasures on earth, debt. And it's debt that ultimately now requires me to have to work harder and try to find more money and and so that I can pay off the debt and then I end up having less of other things that might be intricately more important than that thing that I went into debt for. And ultimately, what can happen is, as you're chasing hard after the treasures of earth, you develop worry. I need more money, more time, more friends, more network, more, and the word more just keeps coming up more and more. And it's before I pray prayers for what I need, maybe I should examine whether or not I actually need it or I just want it. You see, this is what Jesus is telling us, to examine our motives as we come to God with whatever it is we're praying about. And maybe I should examine how I got here and start with repentance. I mean, coming to that moment of prayer and really changing my mind about what is really important in my life. But keep in mind, even really important stuff can make you worry, especially important stuff. Have you ever been afraid of something and it caused you to hold your breath? 
Has that ever happened to you? I mean, it happens to Stephanie every time she's in the passenger seat and I'm driving. It, 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 it can happen. You get all worried and, and you take a breath and you don't even realize you're holding your breath. And it's interesting because doctors and medical studies show that one of the effects of stress and worry can be a lack of oxygen because people either stop breathing or they start breathing too fast. And it can really whack you out emotionally and mentally. And so here's what Jesus is telling us in the passage. Uh, Verse 25, he says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? In other words, he says, when you're asking for stuff, because remember, this is all in the context of the Lord's Prayer, when you're asking for stuff, exhale in faith. I mean, just let it out. Let's try it this morning. I'm serious. Take a deep breath and just let it out. Can you feel that? Here, try it again. Deep breath in and let it out. And the relaxation that just comes from exhaling that deep breath. See, the calming effect of exhaling a deep breath is exactly what can happen when prayer becomes a part of your spiritual connection to God. You can take all of those things that you could bring inside yourself and cause you to hold your breath and cause you to worry, and you can just deliver them to God and exhale in faith that he's got it under control. Jesus says, do not worry about your life. Okay, son of God, easy for you to say. But here, I just have to ask you if you've ever worried about anything in your life. Maybe you live paycheck to paycheck, hoping the money will be deposited on time so that you can pay the mounting bills. And you find that wondering where in the world is it going to come from? You know the reality of bills, and no matter the reasons, good or bad, they're real, and they're there, and they're pressure. Maybe it's your health and the reality of worrying about your sickness, especially in this year that we've walked through together. Or maybe it's the sickness of other people that you love in your life that causes you worry. Or maybe it's relationships, or some broken ones especially with your friends or your children or even your grandchildren where there have been some cross words spoken and you're wondering how you're ever going to reconcile those. See, once you thoroughly examine your prayer motives, you might find that you've made choices that have brought you to this point. And he simply says, I get it. Confess that. Be honest. Jesus welcomes that honesty, even if you've caused all the things that you're worried about. And then he uses the example of the simplest of God's creation, the birds and the flowers. Now, they have everything they need for their existence to live in constant praise and glory to the God who created them. Now, what's interesting is then in verse 26, he asks this profound question. Do you remember it? Are you not much more valuable than they? In other words, you matter a lot to God. He's crazy about you. He went to a lot of trouble to rescue you and bring you back into right understanding of your purpose and why he made you. He loves you that much. And that means he understands every need in your life. The need is daily met with God's provision if you trust him for it and exhale in faith. You see, birds and flowers, he says, have a job in the kingdom of God, and he provides all of the resources those birds and flowers need to to accomplish what it is they're supposed to do for God's glory. And Jesus says, guess what? Your part is in his kingdom work is even greater than the birds and the flowers. So if he's taken care of them, you need to know he's going to take care of your every need. 
So Jesus says, don't stress out, don't worry, don't be anxious. God has whatever you need if you'll just believe that he loves you that much and believe this tool of prayer is what he's given to you so that you can exhale in faith. Now, now some think Jesus somehow minimizes the human experience when he tells us not to worry as if we should never be concerned, but that's not at all what he's saying here. There is a difference between worry and having a healthy concern about important things. Worry is a lack of faith, or really no faith, because worry means you're so dialed into the problem or the crisis or the shortcoming that you can't see who God is and what he's offering you. And he gives an example of that in verse 32 when he says these pagans just keep on babbling. They don't know what they're praying for, but they just know they need something because their life is stressful. But then he says the healthy concern means you understand the gravity of a need and you trust God enough to bring it to him. It doesn't mean you minimize something that's important or a crisis or a tragedy. As a matter of fact, you see it as very important and very concerning. And that's why you come with confidence to the Lord and there deliver that request in faith. It's healthy concern that typically leads you to prayer. And he's encouraging you to bring it to him in prayer. Now, you know it is what is required, big or small, and you choose to believe rather than worry. You know, I don't, I, I don't know if, if I've told you this story before. Maybe I have, so forgive me if, if you've heard me tell it. But, but when I first got out of college and after a little time in politics, I became the financial aid director at Ohio Christian University where I went to school. And we were getting very concerned because our students had little to no money. These were not good economic times. And it was, of course, their ability to pay their bills to the school that allowed the school to continue to exist. And so we found ourselves struggling financially as an institution because our students were struggling financially. And we started to become very concerned about this to the point that we were praying together about it often. And I, I just, you know, I couldn't see the way through this. I, I couldn't see any way that we were going to survive this. And then by chance, and th that's in quotation marks, by the way, this article comes across my desk as to how the Supreme Court had just ruled in favor of a religious studies student in Oregon that all government aid that comes to a student comes to the student instead of the institution. Now, why is that important? It sounds kind of, 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 of wonky for you. Well, stay with me. In Ohio, you were not allowed to receive an Ohio instructional grant or financial aid from the state of Ohio if you majored in one thing, religion. You could get a, a college grant from the state of Ohio for any other major on the planet, you name it, except religion. And as a result, none of our students were eligible for that Ohio instructional grant, except we were praying. And that article came across my desk, and wouldn't you know it, I just had had a little bit of political experience before I went there. And so I called up a couple of elected officials that I knew on both sides of the aisle, and they both agreed that that was crazy and that these students should have the same right to be helped in their college education as everybody else. And so they put a bill onto the floor, a bipartisan bill. It passed the House. It was in Senate committee in the Education Committee in the Senate. I'll never forget it, we go in and we've been praying about this because our students needed this, our institution needed this. <laughs> and we didn't worry, we just trusted God, and would you know it, we go in there and the ACLU lawyer who had come to argue against it stood up and said, well, okay, I forgot about this bill, I'm totally unprepared, I just want you to know we're against it. Yeah, that did nothing, it was beautiful. Because at that point, I mean, it passed through committee, it went to the Senate, it passed the Senate, the governor signed it. And today, ministry, students training for ministry in the state of Ohio can get Ohio instructional grants, all because we prayed to God believing. 
I mean, we exhaled in faith and we trusted him for that and, and it really, really helped save our institution. Now look, I, I tell you that story just as one example of perhaps what can happen in your life when you begin to exhale in faith and trust Jesus is telling you the truth as well. He's saying to you, look, therefore, verse 34, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Yeah, trust me, you'll have a lot of healthy concerns tomorrow as well. So dial in, bring those things to God, he says, and trust him for it. Answers come in the strangest places and in the most unexpected ways. He's saying, so don't worry, just pray. He knows what you need before you ever ask him for it. And by the way, have I told you this yet? He's crazy about you. He loves you and wants to bless your life. And so let's try it one more time. Take a deep breath. Exhale. And think about prayer being just like that, giving you that kind of confidence. And when you put your requests in the context of God's kingdom, examining your motives, and then it reduces your anxiety and worry, and you can exhale in faith, now you're in the right place mentally and spiritually to pray confident prayers to God. See, all of that is just preparing you for praying. And then he says it right here in Matthew 6, Get this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. <laughs> See, he's telling you, when you're asking for stuff, expect an answer. Because that's what he wants for your life. Whatever your daily need, the basics of life, or giant resources to accomplish something God wants you to accomplish, he wants you to believe that he is going to answer that prayer for his glory. Now, now here's what happens. We get it, sometimes the need we have is a self-inflicted wound. We've brought it on ourselves, and we know that because that need is self-inflicted, we feel a high level of guilt about it. Maybe it's a harsh word that you spoke and, and, and hurt somebody badly, and the reason that relationship is broken is because of something you've done. Maybe you spent more than you should have. Maybe you ate poorly and didn't take care of your body, and now you're experiencing all of this sickness or pain or struggle. So we sometimes, because it's self-inflicted, can lack faith because we feel the guilt over making those poor choices. We have trouble approaching God at all let alone with any expectation that he would want to answer our prayer. Now, let me remind you of something. Redemption, which is what Jesus provided you on the cross, is a fresh start. It's a new beginning. It's a life of joy, and it's what Jesus' ministry was all about. He wants you to pray for healing, no matter how you got there. He wants you to trust him for your needs being met, no matter how you got there. He wants to heal the relationships that are broken in your life, no matter how you got there. That's why he came, to bring you to faith, to show you, have I told you lately, that he's crazy about you and that he wants you to trust him. And he may leave some of that pain, that self-inflicted wound, so that perhaps you can be empathetic or sympathetic to someone else who's struggling in it as well and can help them. But be sure, he has not abandoned you because of your failure. He has rescued you. And he knows what he's dealing with. Goofy people who make poor choices. That's who we are. I mean, this hasn't caught him by surprise. Do you realize that the entire Bible was written to goofy people who perpetually make bad choices? And he's saying, this is what I want you to know. Even though you are a goofy person who makes poor choices, I want you to know that you can come to me and pray in confidence, and I can help you make 
better choices. I can help you receive all of the resources you need to accomplish this big thing that he's calling you to do in his kingdom according to his will. I mean, I, it was crazy. When we were first praying about a building for, for our church, I mean, we were over on the east side of town by I-65 in some mosquito-infested field, and we were praying for that field. And, and, and in the midst of it all, we had a lot of dreams for our ministry. And one of the dreams that we had was a preschool and a daycare. We thought that would be an awesome way for us to connect the gospel to the lives of young families, and we'd love for them to experience it. And so a preschool and daycare was part of it. But, you know, when we, when we were thinking about the other side of town, uh, a consultant told us that if we were going to have some property and all of the facilities that we needed to have a preschool and a daycare, it was going to cost us about $6.5 million. And we didn't have $6.5 million. But over time, God ended up giving us this school building, and then ultimately, uh, after paying only $670,000 for that in one year, we now had 32 classrooms, and we had room for a daycare. We just didn't know what we were doing. And these two crazy women walked into the building one day. They're in here today, so I'm calling them crazy in front of their faces. And, and, they, and they came and told us that the place that they had, this preschool, um, no, no longer felt it was part of their ministry idea. And so they, they were very positive about wherever they wanted to go with it. They came here. We prayed about it. We said, this is amazing. Not only did God now give us the largest ministry-based daycare in the state of Indiana, he did it cheap. And he did it because we prayed that he would. See, if he calls us to something, he's going to provide everything we need to accomplish it. Now, maybe that's kind of a, a bigger concept thing than you just in your individual life or in your individual family. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus said these words, not me. I'm not making them up. I'm just telling you what he told you and told me. Whatever you need today, bring it to him. I mean, examine your motives for that thing that you were thinking you need in your life. And then just trust him, exhale in faith. And then come to him and listen, expect an answer. Now here's the thing, uh, you may come to him very specifically and saying this is what I need you to do, and his answer may be I've got a better idea. And it's not always the easy way, but I am telling you it's his way and what we're ultimately praying for, what Jesus said, is your kingdom come, your will be done. And you can exhale in faith knowing that ultimately what you're chasing after in life is the glory of God. Oh, oh, and, and, and one more thing that I want to point out to you. The word supplication, you know, asking for stuff. Well, the original language, root word of that, hiketaria, actually means olive branch. You know, olive branch, the symbol of peace. Because when it's all said and done, men and women, the thing that you're looking for in your life right now more than anything else is peace. Peace of mind, peace of heart, peace of spirit. And that's what he's offering you if you'll recognize that prayer is supplication, <laughs> asking him for stuff that you need for his glory. And you can trust him throughout the whole process because he's crazy about you. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, in this room today, people are needing stuff. And the first thing they recognize is that some of what they need has been brought on by themselves, and we pray that you would just overwhelm them with a sense of your forgiveness and your grace, and they would find you in this moment, putting their faith and trust in the God of the universe. But then, Lord, hear their prayers. Whatever it is that they're praying for, whatever that need is, we pray you would give them the confidence today to exhale in faith and trust you. And that they would be sure that those answers are coming. Lord, we pray that most of all, you would give us the peace of Christ. That his spirit would reign in our hearts. We wouldn't worry or fear. 
that you would give us the confidence we need to know you've got it under control. Whatever it is you need to pray for, you go ahead right now. Whatever specific thing is happening in your life, whatever need you have, offer it up to him in Jesus' name right now. just these few seconds, we sense you're speaking into our hearts. Trust me. And so I pray, Lord, as every prayer has been offered up to you, right now you would speak into every heart. Trust me. And you would give us the peace that we long for. Thank you for this gift of prayer. And for all the times that you have answered us before, we pray you would do it again and again and again lift you up in worship today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's do that. Let's continue to worship him. If there's something you want to pray about at these altars, you feel free to come. Kneel at your couch or your chair at home. Whatever it is, trust him with whatever is going on in your life. Whatever you need, he'll supply.
That's what prayer is. It's confidence that you can approach God and you can bring all that you need to Him. He'll expose the stuff He needs to expose in you and you can confess and turn from that stuff, change your mind, but you can also trust Him that no matter how big the need, He will provide. Thanks so much for joining us online today. We really appreciate your being part of the service. I hope you'll stick around for just a minute as Stephanie tells you more ways that you can respond to what you've experienced today. God bless you. Have a great week and trust the Lord with all of your prayer needs.